Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and all our dangers and our needs. Fulfill and supplant those needs with your presence, your power, your wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Help us to those ends, O holy God, through the merits of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are with Dr. Uh, Millard Erickson, his Christian Theology, Chapter 2, Theology and Philosophy, Types of Relationships Between Theology and Philosophy, some 20th century philosophies, pragmatism, existentialism, analytical philosophy, process, theology, and theology's use of philosophy. That's his outline for the next 20 years chapters. Of all the disciplines of human inquiry and knowledge, probably the one with which theology has the greatest amount of interaction over the years is the history in the church is philosophy. The theologian and philosopher had frequently been partners in dialogue. There are a number of reasons for this, but perhaps the major one is that there is a considerable commonality between the two. <clears throat> For example, they deal with some of the same subject matter. Both treat unseen and trans-empirical objects, at least in the traditional formulation of philosophy. Both are concerned with values, and both have focused at least a part of their attention upon humans. The overlap is particularly true early in the history of philosophy before its many children left home. From the earliest days, many topics now treated by other separate disciplines were part of philosophy. An indication of this is the variety of works in the Aristotelian corpus, mathematics, psychology, political science, and so forth. One by one, however, these children matured and made their own homes, or however, they, where they in turn formed families. It's a nice metaphor. Although psychology, sociology, and other behavioral sciences have long since left the philosophical nest, they still discuss philosophical and theological issue of the nature and purpose of human existence, at least in connection with ethics, and in one sense or another, both philosophy and theology attempt to give an integrative approach to reality, some understanding of life. Where the agenda is at least in part the same, there will inevitably be some type of exchange, types of relationships between theology and philosophy. The relationship between theology and philosophy has taken different forms. The first we will note, in effect, is no relationship at all. That is, theology disjoined from philosophy. The approach manifested itself as early as Tertullian, 160 to 230. Consider his famous lines. What is there in common between Athens and Jerusalem? What between the academy and the church? What between the heretics and the Christians? This is in Tertullian's De Prescriptione Hereticorum, page 7. The approach regards philosophy as having nothing to contribute to Christian theology. In fact, the two have such different goals that the Christian is well advised to avoid contact and dialogue with philosophy completely. Belief does not arise because of support from philosophy or other sources, but virtually in spite of the contribution of these disciplines. This view also appeared in the Middle Ages in the thought of uh, Averroists, who taught virtually a double truth concept that the truth of theology and that of philosophy are two different and separate matters. Martin Luther, reacting against the scholastic 
Catholic philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas tended to reject philosophy in his table talk, let philosophy remain within her bounds as God has appointed and let us make use of her as a character in a comedy. Number two, so that's where there's no relationship. The second position to arise historically was that of Augustine, who felt that theology can be elucidated by philosophy. He stressed the priority of faith and the acceptance of the biblical revelation, but he also insisted that philosophy may help us to better understand our Christian theology. He adopted the philosophy of Plato, finding therein a vehicle for her theology. Augustine felt, for example, that the Christian metaphysic, with its concept of the supernatural world and the created world, which derives from and depends on the supernatural world, might be understood in terms of Plato's imagery of the divided line. On the one side are the unseen ideas, which are more real and sensible objects on the other side. The sensible objects are but shadows cast by these ideas. He's arguing here in using Plato's Republic. The Platonic theory of knowledge was also adapted to Augustine's theology. Plato's taught that all knowledge which we have is actually of the ideas or pure forms in a pre-existent state our soul had contact with these ideas such as whiteness, truth, chairness, enabling us to recognize these qualities in empirical particulars today. Augustine adapted this part of Platonic philosophy to his own doctrine of illumination, the light enlightening every mind which comes into the world. John 1.9 is God impressing the forms upon the human intellect, and he cites the city of God. Chapter 12.25 and on Christian doctrine 2.32. So that's the first is no connection. Secondly, as Augustine is, he's alleging that he's Platonized. We're not quite convinced of that. Number three, theology is sometimes established by philosophy. As Christian theology began to encounter both paganism and non-Christian religions, it became necessary to find some neutral basis on which to establish the truth of an authoritative message. <clears throat> Thomas found such a basis in Aristotle's arguments for the existence of God, which is taken from Thomas's Summa Contra Gentiles or Gentiles. In this case, philosophy was able to supply theology with credibility. In addition, Aristotle's sub substance accident metaphysics Metaphysic became the basis for formulating key doctrines such as the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Number th four, theology may also be judged by philosophy from the position that theology can be proved by philosophy came the logical development that theology must be proved by philosophy in order to be accepted. Deism resolved to accept only those tenets of religion which could be tested and demonstrated by reason. Reference to John Toland's infamous Christianity, not mysterious. Number five, in some cases, theology even supplies content, philosophy supplies content to theology. George Hegel, for example, interpreted Christianity in terms of his own idealistic philosophy. The result was a thoroughly rationalized version. He saw the truths of Christianity as merely examples of a universal truth, a dialectical pattern which history follows. Take the Trinity, for example. 
as a pure abstract thought, God is the Father. As going forth eternally into finite being, he is the Son. As returning home again, enriched by this being, he is the Holy Spirit. Because the doctrines of Christianity fit the triadic pattern of history, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, their truth is established and guaranteed, but as universal truths, not particular facts. Thus, the understanding of Christianity was modified as its content was accommodated to a philosophy believed to be true. Some 20th century philosophies. At this point, it is necessary to examine briefly several philosophical movements of the 20th century because they may, to some extent, influence our thinking, even unconsciously. It is helpful to be able to recognize and evaluate their valid and invalid emphases. Pragmatism. Pragmatism is perhaps the one distinctly American philosophy. It was the most influential philosophy in the United States in the first quarter of the 20th century. And he points to Thayer's Pragmatism in the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Volume 6, page 430. Through John Dewey's influence upon educational philosophy, it exercised much more power than it would be recognized would be recognized from an analysis of its formal constituency. This influence still lives on as a mood of much of American life, long after its popularity as a distinct movement had declined. Although the adherents of pragmatism maintain that it had its antecedents in the thought of such persons of John Stuart Mill, it appears that its actual beginning was in a metaphysical club founded by Charles Sanders Pierce and William James in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the 1870s. It is interesting that both Pierce and James came into philosophy by rather indirect routes. Pierce being a practicing astronomer and physicist, and James traveling the route of medicine and psychology. While the ideas were a group, the first galvanizing event was a paper by Pierce on how to make our ideas clear. It was James, however, who popularized the method of pragmatism, making some important changes in form proposed by Pierce. A common factor in the several varieties of pragmatism is its view of truth. <clears throat> Traditional philosophy was concerned with the quest for absolute reality. Science was seen as pursuing the same goal, but using a different method. Pragmatism emphasized that there is no absolute truth. Rather, the meaning of an idea lies solely in its practical results. Pierce concentrated on the repeatable experiments of the community of scientists. James, on the other hand, stressed the particular beliefs of the individual as a human being rather than as an intellectual investigator. The goal then is not metaphysical truths, statements about the nature of ultimate reality, Rather, the meaning for Pierce or the truth for James of a proposition is its experiential consequences. Pierce took particular note of the doctrine of transubstantiation, which had long, has long been a subject of dispute and disagreement between Roman Catholics and Protestants. He observed that there really is no difference between the two views. For while the adherents of the two views maintain that they are describing different metaphysical conceptions, they actually agree as to all sensible effects. By the same measure, James did not believe that there is any real difference between assigning the origin of the world to purely material forces and assigning them to the creation by God 
since this question only deals with the past. The world is what it is, regardless of how it was made. Although the naturalist cosmologist and the theistic creationists maintain that their ideas are different in practical terms, there's no significant distinction. In the thought of Dewey, pragmatism took yet another turn. Dewey's instrumentalism stressed that logic and truth are to be understood in terms of capacity to solve problems and the impact upon values and moral development of human beings. Religion, in his view, has the instrumental value of bringing persons together in the unity of communication, of shared life, and shared experience. Religion, which does not contribute to this unity, for instance, institutional and creedal religion is to be rejected, which is his creed, which he has wanted institutionalized. It is in the pragmatist sense, not true religion, for it does not help humans individually or collectively to develop true values. With respect to true religion, James once said on pragmatic principles, if the hypothesis of God works satisfactorily in the widest sense of the word, it is true. It is difficult to assess the truth and validity of pragmatism for the writings of Pierce, James, Dewey, and others contain such a variety of viewpoints. Further, the present forms of pragmatism are much more diffuse. In fact, pragmatism appears even within Christian circles in the form of an impatience with issues and ideas that do not show immediate applicability. The value of the moment has been in calling attention to the important link between ideas and actions. Certain cautions or limitations need to be observed, however. Number one, what does it mean to say that something works? Does this not require some standards by which to measure our ideas and actions? To say, as James did, that the true is only the expedient in our way of thinking, just as right is only expedient in the way of our behaving, does not really solve the question. Expedient for whom and for what? If Hitler had won World War II, would his treatment of the Jews have been right? It might have been expedient him, for him, but not for the Jews. Two, in effect, James reduces the proposition, it is true that X exists, to it is useful to believe that X exists. Yet in practice, we certainly distinguish between the two propositions. Further, large numbers of propositions, such as those about past events, seem to have no usefulness one way or the other. There is therefore an unjustified limitation of the realm of true statements. Three, what is the time span for the evaluation of ideas? Is a true idea one which will work immediately? In a year from now, 10 years, and 100 years? This is a question which needs to be addressed. Popular pragmatism tends to assume that immediate workability is the criterion. Yet what is expedient in the short term often term, turns out to be inexpedient in the long term. Well, that's pragmatism. We turn now to existentialism basically atheism. If existentialism was not founded by Soren Kierkegaard, 1813 to 1855, it was at least anticipated by his thought. Kierkegaard was reacting against two major influences upon his life. One was the philosophy of George Hegel, according to which the whole of re reality is rational. The various concepts and facts of reality can be fitted into a logical system. 
in which the individual has no ultimate significance. The other influence on Kierkegaard was the cold formal state church of his native Denmark, in which dispassionate practice was the norm. Friedrich Nietzsche's and atheistic emphasis upon the human will also served to give rise to existentialism, a major tenet of which is subjectivity. In 20th century, Martin Heidegger, Heidegger Jean-Paul Sartre, Carl Jap, Jaspers, and Gabriel Marcel have been spokesmen for this movement. If one were to attempt to summarize existentialism in one sentence, would be that existentialism is a philosophy which emphasizes the priority of existence over essence. <clears throat> that is to say, the question, is it, does it exist, is more important than what is, what is it? But this brief and obscure formula is not very helpful. It is necessary, therefore, to examine several basic tenets of this philosophy. Number one, irrationalism, individuality, freedom, and subjectivity. Number one, there are many aspects or dimensions to the tenet of irrationalism. Basically, it is the contention that reality cannot be captured within or reduced to intellectual concepts. It goes beyond them or breaks out of them. Further, it is not possible to put ideas into a logical system. All such attempts end up distorting the elements. The truth is not smoothly reducible to a neat package of coherent ideas. What reality is looked at intellectually, paradoxes and contradictions emerge. There's no discernible pattern of meaning to be detected by man. The me meaning of reality must be treated by one's own free choice. We're referring here to Jean-Paul Sartre and his existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre. Number two, the individual is of a paramount importance. In part, this means the uniqueness of individual persons. It is not possible to capture an individual by classifying him within a general category or series of categories. I am not simply a member of the class of persons who are white, male, American, blue-eyed, so forth. Even if someone were to add up all these characteristics, including the answers given to each question of the Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory, he would still not have me. He would, at most, have a police description of me, corresponding to emphasis on the individual. There is also within existentialism an emphasis upon particular events or facts. Any effort to develop from these facts or effort some sort of general truths will only give an abstraction not a reality, but a poor shell of it. Number three, another basic axiom of existentialism is human freedom. I am free. Nothing can encumber my ability to choose, to decide my destiny, to create the world, as it were, referring to Sartre's being and nothingness. Sartre's atheism is based largely upon his point of freedom. Page? Page? 20. See? I see it. Got two schools going on here, mine and his. <laughs> A correlative freedom is responsibility. I must not surrender my freedom and individuality by simply accepting what the crowd thinks, says and does. To do so would be inauthentic, inauthentic and we hear, we hear Rudolf Boltman and the New Testament Guild will run down this road and to basically his Gnostic paths. 
one of the chief heretics taken over so comfortably into some Episcopal sectors. I'm thinking at least three or four sermons right off the top of my head that were pure breed Heideggerianism, pure breed uh, Boltmanianism. Acts of cruelty to us who had to sit out there and hear it. One at least understood what was going on. Rather, one must be one's own person, have one's own ideas, do one's own thing, in the popular terminology. Another form of inauthenticity is to deny one's freedom by explaining one's actions on the basis of some form of determinism. Each form of inauthenticity amounts to an unwillingness to accept responsibility for one's own behavior. One has freedom, must admit it, claim it, and exercise it. The final tenet of existentialism is subjectivity. Generally speaking, existentialism classifies into two types. Objective truth is involved when an idea correctly reflects or corresponds with the object signified. Objective truth applies in scientific type endeavors. Subjective truth, on the other hand, is not a matter of correspondence with the object known, but rather of the effect of that object on knowing the knowing subject. Of all the philosophies, exit existentialism probably has been the one most widely used and adopted by theologians in the 20th century, particularly in the period between 1920 to 1956 to 1960. The major influence of Soren Kierkegaard was not upon his day, but upon those who lived two to three generations after his time. Harold Bart, for example, recognized the presence of Kierkegaardian thought in his first attempt, attempts at writing dogmatics. And even though he tried to purge it from later writing, there's some question whether he ever fully succeeded. The indebtedness of Abel Bruner and Reinhold Niebuhr to Kierkegaard is clear, as is the existentialist basis in the thought of Paul Tillich and Rudolf Boltman. There have been various effects of this existentializing of theology. First among them is the subjectivizing of truth. Truth is truth. When it becomes true for me, you see the canon of the ego here. It is not to be thought of as an objective set of propositions. It must be assimilated by someone if it is to be regarded as truth. Second is the separating of religious truth from more objective types of truth in general. Unlike these other types of truth revelation has not come through general culture. A third result of the existentializing of theology is a non-substantive or non-essentialist view of religious reality. Truth, sin, and salvation are not fixed substances. They are not blocks of reality or permanent states. They are dynamic occurrences, pointing to Emil Brunner's The Divine Human Encounter. There are motifs in existentialism that parallel biblical Christianity and have re-emphasized themes which have sometimes been neglected. Among the, these themes are the nature of Christian faith and truths as matters of passion, subjective concern and involvement, freedom and the necessity of choice. The importance and uniqueness of individual persons, paradoxically, the absurdity and despair to which one is led when he views life as having no discernible rational pattern. 
There are also various points of inadequacy within existentialism. The existentialist distinction between objective evidence for the truth of a tenet and fervor, fervency of passion is worth noting. But this passion is often nothing more than an anxiety or insecurity and should not be confused with the inward intensity of commitment which constitutes the Christian faith. In practice, commitment and action tend to increase rather than decrease with certainty. Number two, existentialism has difficulty justifying the choice of one particular object with which to relate in faith. It does not offer a basis for preferring one object to others tends to fall into subjectivism, in which the subjective experience becomes the end in itself. Number three, existentialism has difficulty supporting its values and ethical judgments. If meaning is created by one's choice, are not the good and right whatever one makes them to be by one's own choice, it's egocentrism. On the existentialist grounds, helping an old lady across the road or beating her over the head and snatching her handbag might be equally right. Consider also Sartre's inconsistency when he signed the Algerian Manifesto. He was taking a moral stand which he was urging upon others as if this was somehow objectively right. Yet on his own existentialist terms, there seems to be little basis for his action. We will return to this in our next segment. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let's be 